Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and peace be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Azam Nizamuddin. I'm the chairman of the Interfaith Committee here at the Islamic Foundation, and we'd like to thank you for coming tonight for this very auspicious and impressive occasion. Uh, just so you know, we had 300 chairs out before the event, and we had to add more. So this is a wonderful turnout. So thank you for coming. Your turnout today really is a testament to not only, um, obviously, uh, the speakers that we invited today, but also your dedication and devotion to the interest at issue, which is a very important and timely subject for our um, uh, discussion tonight. Uh, we are thrilled tonight to welcome Professor Miroslav Wolf from Yale University as our keynote speaker, as well as our esteemed panelists here. Uh, we hope you'll enjoy the event tonight, and we hope you find it informative and thought-provoking. Before I go over the agenda for tonight, um, I just want to convey the purpose of why we're here tonight, and uh, why, in particular, our organization, the Islamic Foundation, is hosting this event. Um, one of the things that Muslims and Muslim society in particular have emphasized in their teachings in history, as well as texts, is the concept of knowledge, ilm. In fact, the first word that was revealed from God to the Prophet Muhammad was called Ikra, or read. That deliverance of the term Ikra, or read, heralds the beginning of the entire process of, process of institutional education and learning in the Islamic tradition. It's not limited to texts. It's, limited to, it, it's also expansive in history. For example, uh, when the Muslims conquered Persia, they discovered Greek philosophy. When they discovered Greek philosophy, which from the mindset of Christians and Muslims and Jews and other people of faith, were often described as pagans, you know, non-believers. But the knowledge that ancient Greece had was something that the Muslim civilization incorporated into their own worldview. Not only did they incorporate it, they translated it from the Greek Syriac into Arabic, so that 90% of the works of Plato and Aristotle were translated into Arabic. Ultimately, those are then um, funneled through Spain into Europe, and then there's another translation period that occurs where it's translated into Latin for Christian thinkers. Uh, this process of knowledge gathering and learning from one another is something inherent, and that's one of our missions today is so that we can learn from one of the foremost Christian thinkers, not just Midwest, not just the United States, but globally. Also, I just want to relate a small, another ex historical example of this. <clears throat> in the period in Medina, in which the Prophet Muhammad had lived after his, the Muslim community transferred from Mecca to Medina, he welcomed a delegation of about 14, 15 Christian leaders. And they came and stayed at the mosque in Medina. And they asked questions, they debated with him and his companions. And for three days, the, 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 the Prophet Muhammad and the Muslim community hosted them in Medina. And in those three days, they argued, they debated, they discussed the differences they had about the concepts of God and scripture. And yet, at the end of the three days, the Christian delegation prayed according to their own process in the mosque in Medina, and then departed on good terms. That spirit is something that we not only should, but we need to inculcate in the United States all throughout this country, and particularly today. today. As you're all aware, there are many forces in our society that aim to create division, to build barriers, and to fan, uh, fan the flames of fear. Some people, whether they're politicians, pundits, or the media, they want to show how much differences there are between us and sow the seeds of discord. Instead of the commonality, the examples of I, that I just laid out. It's important, however, to recognize that we don't always have the same beliefs, that we have differences of opinion. But 
the bottom line is that even if our religious communities have different sets of belief, we still share the same values, the values of love, the values of faith, the values of raising children, the values of education, the values of earning an honest, good day's work and living. So that is the reality, ladies and gentlemen. Our goal tonight is certainly not to preach or to convert either side, but it's simply to elevate the discourse between, in particularly, I should say generally, between all people of faith, but in particularly between the Christian and Muslim community. True knowledge requires listening, understanding, reflection, and conversation. Regardless of your religious beliefs, or no beliefs, we are all brothers and sisters. After all, we're part of the one human family. There isn't a Muslim world, a Christian world. There's one world. We're grateful that you are here and you've joined us tonight at the Islamic Foundation Mosque. As it is customary in our tradition, we typically begin most events with a recitation of a few verses from the Holy Quran. With that, we will go ahead and outline the remaining program. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, our young colleague tonight, Mr. Amar Huck, who is actually a graduate of the Islamic Foundation here school. From, uh, and he then graduated and went to Elmhurst, so he's a local guy. And he works as an anesthetist at St. Luke in Milwaukee. He's also known as a hafiz, which means he has memorized the entire text of the Quran. And he often leads the evening Ramadan prayer. So with that, Amar Haq. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم 
هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم <coughs> And the translation is as follows <coughs> In the name of God the most gracious the most merciful O believers, be conscious of God and let each soul consider what it has laid in stock for tomorrow. And be pious before God. God is all experienced as to what you do. Be not like those who forgot God and God made them forget themselves. These are the dissolute. Unequal are the denizens of the fire and the denizens of the garden. The denizens of the garden are the victors. Had we sent down this Qur'an upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled, shattered from the fear of God. These parables we strike for mankind that they may come to reflect. He is God, there is no God but He, knower of the unseen and the seen, the all-merciful, compassionate to each. He is God, there is no God but He, sovereign, all-holy, the bringer of peace, the all-faithful, the all-preserver, the almighty, the all-compelling, the all-sublime. Glory to him far above what they associate with him. He is God, the creator, the originator, the giver of forms. To him belong the names most beautiful. All on earth and in heaven magnify him. He is the almighty, the all-wise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar, for that beautiful recitation. Um, there are lots of people here, uh, some important officials, um, and I'm going to try to mention them throughout the program. Um, but up front is Mike Noland, who is a state senator from Illinois. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, Father Timus Bema from the Chicago Archdiocese of Chicago. He has many titles, but. Uh, Scott Alexander, Professor of Christian Muslim Relations from the Catholic Theological Union. Where are you, Scott? Oh, there he is. He's in the back. <laughs> Professor Inamul Huck uh, from Elmer's College is also here. <laughs> Reverend Jay Moses, a very good friend of the Islamic community here, and Chief uh, Minister, Pastor of Hope Presbyterian Church. Um, with that, I'd like to invite another important uh, dignitary who's here, and that is um, Deborah Bullwinkle, who is the mayor of Lombard. Um, Deborah is currently serving as the mayor of the village of uh, Villa Park. I said Lombard. I meant Villa Park. Sorry. I love Lombard, too. <laughs> uh, this is a position she's had since 2013. Prior to her election as mayor, she served four years as a village trustee, also an elected position. Um, Deb? Thank you for joining us. Come on up. Welcome. This is wonderful. And this is why we're here, for a nice warm welcome. So I want to thank the Islamic Foundation of Villa Park, wonderful stewards of our village, for hosting this event tonight. It's a real treat. I also want to uh, thank the esteemed panel of guests that we have with us, and also I want to thank you for coming from all over, from what I understand. The folks I've talked to, you've come from all over the Chicago metro area. So thank you very much. 
The theme for tonight's program is all about doing what we can collectively together to show solidarity and support for one another and to embrace diversity amongst one another. Especially in a world today that's wrought with hate, pain, and anxiety. Tonight is a wonderful opportunity for us to come together, explore our common bonds, and seek peace together as a community to make things a little bit better for each of us. I love to talk about peace. We have quite a few opportunities here with the Islamic Foundation to talk about peace together. It's about freedom from disturbance, quiet, and tranquility. We all deserve to live a peaceful life, free from disturbance, free from violence, free from fear. We heard a little bit about fear earlier today. Every day in Villa Park, we strive to provide and maintain a peaceful environment for, for everybody, our guests, our residents, anybody who comes through town. And as mayor, I often talk about a sense of community here in Villa Park. Those of you who are with us tonight have heard me mention that before. This evening, we are experiencing a sense of community right here in this room. Look around. There's over, what, probably close to 400 people here now that came together tonight on a Saturday night to spend a little bit of time together. It feels pretty good. <laughs> Diversity is healthy. It's okay to be different. And don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. We should embrace the uniqueness in all of us. We're all special in our own special way. So embrace and celebrate each other as we continue on our path to joy, harmony, and peace one day at a time. Thank you, and again, welcome to Villa Park. Thank you, Mayor Deb. Uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of tonight's program is the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago, which is really the main spokes vehicle for the 400,000 Muslims that live in the Chicagoland area, representing over 60 uh, mosques, Islamic centers, full-time schools, and other service-oriented organizations. Uh, and the chairman of that has been very supportive of this program tonight, and I'd like to call him up. This is Dr. Mohammed Kaysar Dean, the chairman of the CIOGC. All praises belong to God, and may his choices, blessings be on the prophets that he has sent for guidance of mankind. Who would have thought on a, that a topic like do Muslims and Christians believe in the same God have attracted 400 people on a Saturday evening? We have a couple of people to thank for that, Dr. Hawkins and Wheaton College. Thank you. And in this process, we will learn a lot and, and hopefully get to know each other better and, uh, uh, and get to understand each of each one uh, each other better the council of islamic organizations is very pleased to co-sponsor this event with the islamic foundation and uh, i want to tell you that the council of islamic organization has been and by the way azam nizamuddin who is our mc and leader of, the, of this program is also the co-chair of the Interfaith Committee of Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago. Under that umbrella, we are doing a lot of interfaith activities. I just want to mention a couple of them because I don't want to take too much of your time. With the Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago we are, and, and CIOGC, we are engaged in a scholarly dialogue series, um, which about three or four times, maybe five times a year, people get together, scholars from Catholic side and scholars from Muslim side, and pick a topic and, and exchange ideas as to what they think about this topic. And similarly, we have a scholarly dialogue going between the Muslim community and the Jewish community. Jewish scholars from the Board of Rabbis and Muslim scholars from the CIOGC get together and similarly exchange topics. We also have covenants of cooperation with the United Methodist and the Presbyterian of Chicago. And we get together annually at dinners and, and so on. So we're pleased to do these things. And also, I want to tell you that lately, one, on one side we see a lot of negative uh, 
atmosphere about Muslims going on. On the other side, I look at the positive side. We also look, should look at the positive side, that there has been so much outpouring of support and solidarity for the Muslim community, and we truly appreciate that from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khasruddin. Um, again, on behalf of the Islamic Foundation and the board, uh, including uh, Mr. Aptab Khan, who's here, as well as Dr. Yusuf Chaudhry, who's here, we'd like to welcome you all. We're going to get started with the program because we're running late, so um, this is what we've really been waiting for tonight. We're, again, very honored to have uh, Professor Miroslav Wolf. He is the founder and director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, and he's also the Henry Wright Professor of Theology at Yale University Divinity School. Uh, Professor Wolf was educated in his native Croatia, but he also attended education in the United States and Germany. He has written or edited 15 books and over 70 scholarly articles, which means that these articles that he wrote, 70 of them, have been peer-reviewed by other scholars in the field. His most significant books include Exclusion and Embrace, after Our Likeness, and Allah, A Christian Response, Whether Muslims and Christians Have a Common God. After receiving his bachelor's from the Evangelical Theolog Theological Faculty in Croatia, he received his MA from Fuller Theological Seminary, and also from the University of Tübingen, Germany. In 2007, Professor Wolf was the lead author of the Christian Response a common word between us and you, a historic open letter signed by 138 Muslim scholars across the world, clerics and intellectuals, which identified core common ground at the heart of the Christian and Muslim faiths. The Yale response to this common word was drafted initially by Professor Wolf and was published in November 2007 as a full page advertisement in the New York Times, signed by more than 130 prominent Christian leaders and scholars throughout the world. He has given prestigious lectureships at Harvard, Oxford, Stockholm, and Duke University. Now, this is all well and good. I'm sure many of the young people understand that. But the most important value, I think, is the fact that he has a very long Wikipedia page. <laughs> and because we're so much into social media, I think we can really appreciate that. So his Wikipedia page is longer than George Wills, John Esposito, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who's a very prominent American Muslim scholar, and also Dr. Tariq Ramadan. In fact, his Wikipedia page is even longer than the oldest reigning justice of the Supreme Court Justice Anthony, uh, Anthony Kennedy. Okay? However, uh, Professor Wolf's Wikipedia page did not in any way match the length of Kanye West's Wikipedia page. <laughs> With that, I'm honored and privileged and delighted to bring up Professor Miroslav Wolf. Thank you. Yeah, some people need Wikipedia pages like me and other people don't uh, because everybody knows about them. Um, I am uh, delighted to be here with you. I have a little bit of a problem. Uh, I come from a part of the world where, where we speak with our hands. And uh, my, my sons tell me if somebody bound my hands behind, I would remain mute. I would not be able to speak. So I will try to see whether I can put this back and then, uh, then uh, um, see whether I can, I can use my hands as I speak to you because I think you will be... Is that good? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. I'm really delighted uh, to be here with you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this opportunity, and uh, it is absolutely extraordinary to see so many of you present for what may look like a very arcane topic. Uh, do Muslims and Christians believe in the same God? And here it is, a theological theme that is significant culturally for us and important to discuss in our time because it is a kind of area where the relationships between Islam and Christianity can be measured and can be advanced or can be hindered. 
Now, I have some 25 to 30 minutes to speak to you, and instead of giving you an academic lecture, I want to speak to you more personally. I want to give you my story, how I got into this discussion, what I learned from it. If you want to read more, you can read my book, Allah, it's even out there. Uh, and, uh, but right now, it's a mo more of a moment of uh, kind of putting on the table the story that lies behind it. So it's more personal than academic. And let me say from the start that I am a traditional classical uh, Christian in all my beliefs. I believe what the church, I'm fine, a little bit closer? Okay, I will, ooh. <laughs> now, now I sound really important. <laughs> okay, I'll try to continue in this way. Um, first thing that I want to mention is that I, uh, I'm a classical Christian. I believe uh, roughly everything that for centuries Christians have believed. Um, I believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for humanity's sins. I believe in the Holy Trinity. Uh, everything that the church has believed classically, I believe. All right, so that's just to just to be uh, just to begin uh, the, the the our discussion. And just as such a Christian, I feel motivated to reach out to Muslims. And just as such a Christian, I believe that I can, with full uh, clarity of conscience and intellectual responsibility, affirm that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. Now, I'm not saying that Islam and Christianity are the same religion. Obviously, they are not. And there's no aim behind to make Islam and Christianity the same religion. I'm not also saying that Muslims and Christians aren't worshipping God differently. That is, that their worship itself might be different between two groups. I'm also not saying that there are no significant differences between Muslim and Christian understandings of God, we'll come to some of, some of those. The only thing that I'm claiming, and it's a significant thing that I'm claiming, and by the way, you know that it's significant because there are people who vociferously oppose you making that statement. <laughs> they think it's important to oppose it, therefore it's important to make it, right? <laughs> I think that's quite right. So my uh, contention is, that Muslims and Christians, when they worship God, they have the same object in mind, and that that object has similar moral characteristics. Now, let me try to explain, uh, say, explain this a bit. Um, but before I do so, let me tell you how I got into this, this topic. As you well know, in 2006, uh, then Pope Benedict XVI has written a very famous, uh, has given a very famous lecture, so-called Regensburg Lecture. And in this lecture, especially in the introductory section of that lecture, he uh, made some uh, uh, rather inflammatory from perspective of certain, uh, of our Muslim population, remarks about Islam. Uh, Muhammad, he said, commanded uh, to spread the faith with by the power of the sword. Now, most of the debate uh, in aftermath of the lecture centered around this claim of, uh, or this quotation, in fact, uh, that, uh, that, that Benedict XVI made. But in fact, the entire lecture was about the profound difference he claimed that uh, marks the, the understanding of God in Islam and Christianity. And roughly, the difference was that God of Islam is God of arbitrary will, God of Christianity is the God of reason, God of Islam is the foundation of an authoritarian society, God of Christianity is the foundation of reasonable, reasoned democracy. That, too, was a, a rather stark claim. Um, 
response from the from the Muslims uh, was varied, but the at the intellectual level, uh, at the level of engagement with the ideas, I think the most prominent response in the end ended up being just this common word that Azam had mentioned. Uh, and my very good friend, um, Prince, um, Prince Ghazi of Jordan, uh, was the principal author of the common word. And uh, the basic claim of the common word is that what is common between Islam and Christianity is that both uh, have at their center the command to love God above all things, and to love one's neighbor. Now, when I read that, I thought, now this is the Islam that I generally was not familiar with. And mind you, I grew up in a country which has a sizable Muslim population. In fact, I was born in a fortress that was built after the Turks, Muslim Turks, have withdrawn from the gate of Vienna in order to fortify then that, uh, the, 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 the area from further incursions. And when I was a little boy, I used to play in another such fortress. Everywhere, the signs of tensions between Christianity and Islam were present, uh, present where I was. I've also studied a bit, uh, a bit uh, Islam myself, and yet for me, that statement that what binds Muslims and Christians is the command to love God and to love neighbor was relatively new. I latched onto it, and uh, as Azam has mentioned, I was one of the first to respond to that, uh, to that statement and organize a Christian re positive response to the statement. That means positive response meant not we fully agree with everything that Muslims say about God, about neighbor, uh, and about love, but we can take up this idea of love of God and love of neighbor and develop uh, a fundamental, conversa important conversation about the nature of our relationship. Now, fundamental for our response, and not just for our response, but also for the conference that we've organized a year later in 2008 at Yale about uh, the response and about the common word where the signatories of the common word and many of the signatories of the Yale response met together. Issues that became fundamental for me, the questions that became fundamental for me were these. Okay, let's agree that Muslims and what binds Muslims and Christians is the command to love God above all things and to love neighbor as oneself. Let's agree that that's true. Now the question is, do Muslims and Christians think, understand love in the same way? Do Muslims and Christians understand neighbor in the same way? Do Muslims and Christians then understand God in the same way. If neighbor is differently understood in Islam than in Christianity, if God is differently understood in Islam and Christianity, if love is understood differently in Islam and Christianity, the statement that what binds Muslims and Christians is that we should love God above all things and love neighbors ourselves is completely meaningless. So we have to find and, and determine whether there are, in fact, significant overlaps. And one of my then uh, decisions was to explore precisely the question that, that is at the center of this discussion, and that is whether our understanding of God is not the same necessarily, but is sufficiently similar so that we can say that we give devotion to the same object, even though we may debate about how this object is to be understood, the same God. And I have tried to, to argue that in a very simple uh, way, and I'll list uh, a few, few uh, of the steps in this argument. Uh, first, uh, I, I thought, well, how do we determine whether the object is the same? Well, here are some fundamental things that both Muslims and Christians believe. We believe that God is one. We believe that God is different than the world categorically different than 
the world. And we believe that God created the world. So I said to myself, well, if Muslims or Christians were to point to the object which they worship, they would point in the same direction. <laughs> because there's no other object to which they could point given these three beliefs. Now, the question then becomes, well, are the moral characteristic of this object <laughs> that we worship, are they similar? And uh, it is, seems to me very, seem to me very clear that similarities are obvious. Both in Islam and Christianity believe that God is merciful and that God is just. Interestingly enough, also the commands of God are similar in Islam and in Christianity. All ten commandments, no, it's not true, nine commandments <laughs> that you find in the Bible are also found in the Quran. And interestingly enough, it's just those nine commandments which actually Christians do hold onto. The only command that's not present is the Sabbath uh, commandment. So if God's characteristics are similar, if God's commandments are similar, I think we can then say provisionally that Muslims and Christians worship, that believe in the same God. Now, that doesn't mean that they worship God in the same way. That doesn't mean that their worship is equally good even, but it means that the object of worship is the same. Now, when I was working on this, on this book, uh, obviously I knew immediately that there is a big problem to this statement. And the big problem to this statement is that Christians believe that God is the Holy Trinity, and Muslims strenuously deny that claim. So, I was one, once in um, United Arab Emirates, and I was visiting my good friend, who I've gotten to know through the common word, Habib Ali al Jifri, who is a wonderful, um, um, devout teacher, uh, spiritual teacher from that part of the world, from Taba Foundation. We were sitting together in a car and we were driving, and so I asked him, uh, I said, Habib Ali, do you think Muslims and Christians worship the same God? And Habib Ali tells me, he says, well, it says in the Quran, your God and our God is one. And I said, Habib Ali, isn't that a little bit too easy of an answer? And so I said, we Christians believe that God is the Holy Trinity. Muslims do not believe that God is the Holy Trinity. How can you say that Muslims and Christians worship the same God? And he said, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury, Ron Williams, in Cairo, gave a very important lecture in which he emphasized the absolute unity of God. And I said to him, Habib Ali, do you know that what Archbishop of Canterbury said in Cairo is nothing new? That's what Christians have believed throughout the century. If you take the great teachers of the Christian faith, uh, that's what you will read in them. And his eyebrows went up. And I said, you know, here, here's, I'll tell you something. Christians believe, classical Christians believe, in numerical identity of the divine substance. Numerical identity of the divine substance. Now, let me put, give you a footnote. This isn't quite right, because I believe it's true of, Islam, of Muslims as it is true of Christians. We really don't think that numbers apply to God in the same way that they apply to ordinary things in, the, in this life. But for the purposes of discussion, that suffice, right? And he said, Miroslav, do you have time? I was going to fly next day uh, from, uh, from Dubai uh, back, back home. Do you have time to come this evening to my foundation, Taba Foundation, and we can discuss this? I said, of course, uh, Habib Ali, I, I've got all the time in the world. <laughs> and so we stayed late into the night and discussed this idea that Christians believe that there, is, uh, that, that there isn't three sitting on three thr thrones 
And when something has to be decided, then the three discuss it together and then make the common decision. Now, Christians would believe, Orthodox Christians would believe that this is polytheism. This would be the denial of the most fundamental convictions that Christians have. So God, from Christian perspective, does not have associates. It's not that you have God and something is associated with God. From Christian perspective, God is absolutely and indivisibly one. And only as one can be understood as the divine trinity. And that's nothing new that I'm telling you right now. This is what is written in, if you uh, uh, read Augustine, if you read Thomas Aquinas, if you, you name the, the orthodox person, they will tell you exactly that thing. So from the Christian standpoint, then I can affirm, because Christians affirm this indivisible unity of God, that we worship the one obstacle is removed from believing that uh, Christians and Muslims do not worship the same God. Though obviously, we understand differently the nature of God. Where we, where we understand the nature of God may be differently as well, and uh, there's some dispute about this, is that Christians affirm that God is, from eternity to eternity, unconditional love. The claim is not that God loves simply. Because if your claim is that God loves, then tomorrow God might not love. Then the claim might be if you are not pleasing to God, God might not love you. That is not the Christian claim. Christian claim is that irrespective of who and how we are, God's love utterly and totally does not change. God's love may be experienced in different ways, but it is unchanging reality because God is love. I was once driving with my four-year-old son uh, up to visit my sister. And during that drive, he was really bored. And so I tried to entertain him by telling him what I've done the night before. And the night before, I went to see a play called Metamorphosis. And so he uh, asked me, well, what's metamorphosis? And I said, well, that's when people transform, uh, when things transform themselves. Oh, he knew everything but transformation because he knew transformers, right? How one thing can become something, something else, right? And so I think, okay, so how do I, uh, in the, wh what do I tell him about it? And so I said, you know, there are many stories in this metamorphosis. There are stories of things that are being, that, that, that get to be transformed. Like, you know, you touch, uh, you, you become golden, right? Or there's this story about this man who was observing one woman who was making, who, was, who knew magical tricks. And when I mentioned magical tricks, his eye got all, got all, uh, got all big. And so she, he was observing how she transformed herself from, uh, from a human being into a bird. Oh, this was really very cool. And then this guy uh, tried to emulate what she did. And when he tried it, he became a donkey with shaggy ears. And so now Nathaniel was all quiet. And I was unprepared for what he would tell me, what he would ask me. After a long pause, he said, Dad, would you love me if I became a donkey? <laughs> and I said, Nathaniel, <laughs> if you became donkey, you wouldn't be Nathaniel. And immediately I knew this is the wrong way to go. <laughs> <laughs> this is not time for philosophical discussions about identity, right? <laughs> The philosopher dad has been put to right by the four-year-old kid, right? He wanted to know, dad, no matter what happened to me, how I change, would you still love me? And that is, in profound in the character of God who is love. That is that God loves irrespective of whether we have shaggy ears and tail, or we are just normally dressed up as we ought to be. Now, those are some of the differences I claim, I think, 
And if I were told that these differences do not exist, I would be happy uh, about this. But notwithstanding these differences, I think we can affirm that Muslims and Christians actually believe and worship the same God. Now, I think what's important when we state this is that this opens up not only possibility for a better coexistence with one another, because it places us in the same moral universe. I think what's also important is that it makes it possible for us and helps us to debate some of the most important issues that we are facing today. And let me tell you why I think that the discussions and debates between Muslims and Christians are significant in today's culture. Each great religion, Christianity, Islam, other religions as well, in their most basic convictions, they are visions of the right way of living before God and with one another in the world. They are the visions, if you want to put it this way, of human flourishing. They're visions of good life. When we differ, these discussions can be made really productive. I teach at Yale a course that is called Life Worth Living. We find ourselves in a situation where majority of people never ask this question of themselves. What is the life that is truly worth living? We find ourselves in a situation where students in our universities do not ask that question. That question. They're being taught how to be superb technicians, how to find the best means to get from point A to point B, whatever that point A and point B is, how to be useful citizens in the world. This is a great question to ask, but what is left unaddressed is what is the point B where we should be going? <laughs> we are taught today how to succeed in one or the other endeavor that we undertake, and we are good at that, but we are not taught how to succeed as human beings. Our great religions are repositories of, of most compelling visions of the good life. And what we do in this course, we get students together, we sketch various, these various visions, and then we tell them, this is the time to discuss and debate the truth of these positions. And I think we need to be in a situation where we have enough commonality, where the discussions of this nature can be carried productively, and yet at the same time, a sturdy and strong commitment to truth, rather than simply thinking of our religious traditions, as many in the Western world do, as uh, dishes placed before us on some kind of a smorgasbord, and we take nuggets of wisdom from here, nuggets of wisdom from there, and put things together without any true claim upon our lives. What binds, I think, Muslims and Christians together in a significant way is that each of us think that the questions of the right living, of the good life, are fundamental questions that concern the truth about our existence. We ought to engage these questions with respect. We ought to engage these questions with passion. And partly we can do that because we, Muslims and Christians, believe that we refer to in our worship and in our beliefs to God who is one and who is creator and who is just and merciful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wolf. Wasn't that a wonderful, in-depth, beautiful analysis of a very complex issue? <laughs> we're going to go immediately, because time is short, we're going to go immediately into our panel discussion. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask the panelists to make a few minute comments to what they just heard. Okay? So uh, the panelists that we've invited today, and we're thrilled to have, uh, is um, Professor Rita George 
Turkovic from Benedictine University. Come on up, Rita. <laughs> Professor Mark Swanson. Come on up, Mark. <laughs> Sheikh Mohammed Amin Kalwadia. Uh, and also Matthew J. Milliner. Come on up, Matt. Um, and I just want to uh, also, before we get into the panel discussion, just recognize a couple people in the audience uh, that were also important dignitaries here. Uh, uh, we have Pat Kitchen from the Church of Latter day Saints, who's here. Uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, who is a resident scholar at the Islamic Center of Wheaton, is also here somewhere. Okay. And of course, uh, one of our uh, very honored guests tonight, uh, Professor Larisha Hawkins, is also here. Um, and we will have a, pres a special presentation for uh, Professor Hawkins later after the panel discussion, so don't leave. Okay, so let's get started with that. Um, I'm going to kind of give you the order um, of who is going to remark. Just take a few minutes uh, for this esteemed panel. I'm going to ask uh, first uh, Rita. Uh, I'm going to ask Rita George Turvigan, who is the professor um, of theology uh, at um, Benedictine University. She uh, did her PhD from Notre Dame, and she's also very active in interfaith relations. And her PhD uh, was really about uh, medieval Christian scholars and their engagement with the Muslim community. So, uh, Professor George, can you, uh, or Turvik, can you share some insights? Thank you, Azam. Dr. Wolf says he's a classical Christian, and indeed the historical tradition supports what he says about one God, same object. I study Latin Christians of the later medieval period, so 13th century through 15th. And these theologians really had two main questions about Islam. Is Muhammad a true prophet, and is the Quran authentic revelation? Now these Latin Christians could be divided into two groups, those with very little knowledge of Islamic doctrine, of Arabic, etc and those who had quite a bit. What is interesting is that no matter their level of knowledge about Islam, nearly every single Latin Christian writing on Islam at this time explicitly recognizes Islam's monotheism. Many Latin theologians of the time acknowledged that Muhammad, even though they don't think he's a prophet, did at least one good thing, and that is he succeeded in making monotheists out of the formerly polytheistic Arabs. But many Latin Christians went further. They affirmed explicitly the concord between Christian and Islamic doctrines of God. I'll just mention three quickly. Alan of Lille, who was fighting heretics in southern France and knew very little about Islam, he notes, quote, with Christians, they Muslims agree in affirming one God, creator of the universe. Roger Bacon also says, God is infinite power, wisdom, goodness, the creator. So many of the same attributes that Professor Wolf mentioned, uh, Roger Bacon mentions, and he says that in this, Mongols, Saracens, Jews, and Christians agree. And finally, Ricola de Monte Croce, 13th century, he said, for their Quran says about God, do not say three. At once it gives the reason, because God is one and only. We do not say contrary, we Christians, but we affirm with them, Muslims, that God is one, who is not only one, but the most simple. We give him neither consort nor participant, just as they do not. Moving to the 21st century in the Vatican Council, the Council Fathers debated Nostra Aetate and they argued about many things to include on the section of Islam. But again, the one thing they did not argue about is that Muslims and Christians worship the same one God. 
So Dr. Wolf and, and Dr. Hawkins um, are right in line with the classical Christian tradition. And in fact, for Catholic Christians, the question whether Christians and Muslims worship the same God is a non-issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Professor Mark Swanson, who is the Harold Vogelar Professor of Christian <coughs> Muslim Studies and Interfaith Relations at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We can certainly multiply witnesses uh, to this claim that it, sim it is right to say that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. Um, Rita started us off in the 13th through the 15th centuries. Uh, I teach stuff from the 9th century. Uh, and just a couple of days ago, uh, students of mine and I were reading a uh, manuscript from the 9th century, the 9th Christian century, um, which was an old translation of the New Testament in Arabic. And there, of course, we find that the word Allah is used throughout for God. There's no question about it. Furthermore, in this particular manuscript, at the heading, we have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know, at that time in the ninth century, this Christian writer had absolutely no difficulty in using this formula uh, at the beginning of sacred scripture. Uh, so this, this is interesting, and throughout this literature, we find that certainly Christians and Muslims argue, they argue about the characteristics of this God, they, they argue about what is the language that we want to use in order to describe the way in which this God is one, we have very vigorous discussions about that, uh, but they know what they're talking about. They're talking about the same object. But I don't think we need to go back to the ninth century. Certainly today, I mean, Christians and Muslims are able to talk to each other about God. Uh, we easily talk about the God who spoke the, world, spoke the world into being, the God who continues to speak to humankind, the God who invites our responses of prayer, praise, thanksgiving, and intercession, and the God who has the last word on the day of judgment. Uh, we're able to speak there. Our theologians are able to speak. Our mystics are able to speak with one another, and they bear witness to one another of the God uh, that we worship. And this might be a little awkward to bring up, but I think also converts uh, bear this witness as well. Uh, there, of course, throughout Christian Muslim history, there have been Christians who have become Muslims and there have mus been Muslims who have become Christians. I think that their witness is worth listening to. Uh, I, certainly people I know who have converted one way or the other bear witness, not that I have left one God behind and adopted a new one, but rather that I have come to know the God I have always worshipped in a somewhat different way. So these, these exist. Just one word of thanks at the end. I think that the question that Dr. Wolf has asked is very serious. The one is, what is the life that is truly worth living? And here, indeed, um, this points to the importance of this conversation because Muslims and Christians, in answering that question, what is the life that is truly worth living, will say things such as Saint Antony says in one of the sayings of the Desert Fathers, you know, keep God always before your eyes. And as I have heard Muslims uh, say to me and to teach me, um, that the meaning of ihsan, the beautiful life, is to live as though you were always seeing God and knowing that even if you do not see God, know that God sees you. We have common ground, common experience here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, we're gonna go to uh, Professor Matthew Milliner, uh, who's the Associate Professor of Art History at Wheaton College, right here in DuPage County. He has his MD, MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary. Well, uh, Matt, you've heard all this stuff. What does Wheaton College have to say? No. 
<laughs> Don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, we, we at Wheaton College, we've been fantasizing about alternate realities. Um, what if we had heard remarks like we just did tonight from Professor Wolf five years ago? He could have shown us what it's like to be an institution of Christian conviction that reaches out in peace to our non-Christian neighbors. And if that had happened, maybe we would have been prepared to reach to our Muslims in the neighborhood of Wheaton before the unfortunate controversy with Professor Hawkins began. Taking advantage of the generous open houses, for example, maybe at the Islamic Center of Wheaton. What if our students had had the courage to issue a statement condemning anti-Muslim rhetoric amongst our fellow Christians? Wouldn't it have been wonderful, we've thought to ourselves, if in the last two months we were constantly engaging with the Muslims around us, clearly expressing our differences theologically, but also standing with them against injustice? We've dreamed of a Wheaton where professors meet with major Muslim scholars, where they travel to Iran and are warmly received, where the chief publication with which we're associated features cover stories on thoughtful Christian engagement with Islamic art. Wouldn't all that have been wonderful? But of course, as some of you will have figured out, I'm being facetious. Everything I just said is true. What I just described is not a fantasy institution. It's the real Wheaton College that so few people know about. Professor Wolf did come in 2011. He gave a fantastic address, as good as this one. And we listened. And so this October, before the controversy with my friend Larisha began, we were already meeting the Islamic Center of Wheaton, taking advantage of their generous open houses. I frequently point out that my one-year-old son was held by more Muslims than Christians because he is passed around so often by the women at the mosque. And the kind grandmothers at my own church are determined to tip the scales, so they pass him around now. The Triv and the Washington Post correctly reported that Wheaton College students urged us to, quote, follow the voice of Jesus, calling us to love our neighbors and to pursue peace toward those hostile to us and to our faith, and to stand in solidarity with our Muslim brothers and sisters, a statement issued four days before the controversy broke out. When my friend Risha took on that challenge and donned a hijab in solidarity, Things went awry, and the administration made some missteps that have had negative and regrettable consequences, not the least of which is the decision of Professor Hawkins at Wheaton to part ways. But it's important to realize that this controversy has only intensified our engagement with Islam. Some of us met with the 15,000 Muslims at the Islamic Society of North America meeting in Chicago. As pressures against Muslims in our community continued, we stood together at another event at the Islamic Center of Wheaton where I first met Azam, who has helped organize this event. These meetings have now continued at the Islamic Center of Naperville, where there is a Wheaton College representation on an interfaith panel, and now here. We're not here in secret. There are a lot of Wheaton students here tonight. We have administrative support. And at the height of it all, as the media were telling us that we were a hotbed of Islamophobia, my colleague Adam Wood, went to a philosophy conference in Tehran, and there he was more warmly received as a Wheaton representative than he would have been at any secular American philosophy conference. And he was given a chance on television, translated of course, to testify to his faith in Jesus Christ. And indeed, the current issue of Wheaton, the Wheaton-based publication, Books and Culture, features a cover story on the Muslim filmmaker Majid Majidi, the article is the very picture of principled Christian engagement with the beauty of Islam. I brought some extra copies. I didn't know there would be so many people here. I would have brought more. <laughs> Editor John Wilson planned this issue long before this controversy took place. And one result of the final reconciliation between Professor Hawkins and the administration has been a formal administration-sponsored interfaith activity that will be happening every year. Muslims coming to our campus to discuss our many similarities and our crucial differences. Now, I will admit to losing hope that the media can hear any of what I just told you, because my colleague Noah Toll and I related all of it to a reporter who recorded every word, and to my absolute bafflement, the program that ended up being issued was just talking about our Islamophobia. What? We told you all this stuff. <laughs> But it really doesn't matter if we're misunderstood because we're going to keep going. 
We're not meeting with our Muslim neighbors because we want to be recognized for doing so. <laughs> yeah. We're meeting with them because we believe in the God who does not just have love. As we just heard, he is a community of love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he is love. We believe that one of the members of that trinity, Jesus, took on human flesh, was crucified and rose from the dead. And in the mystery of his risen life, he is with those who are maligned and marginalized and misunderstood. And so we see our Lord Jesus reflected in the eyes of our Muslim neighbors. And so to hate our Muslim neighbors would be to hate him. Let me conclude by thanking the organizers of this panel for giving us an opportunity to tell you the things that are really happening. Do we worship the same God? You know what? Let's keep debating that because it's what makes conversations like this possible. But I will tell you one thing that I'm absolutely certain about, that whether or not they worship the same God, evangelicals and Muslims are both willfully misunderstood by the same American media. <laughs> Uh, our last panelist is Sheikh Mohammed Amin Kalwadia, who is the founder and president of Dar al Qasim, an institute of higher Islamic learning. Sheikh Amin has been a, one of the leading theologians in the Chicago community for several decades now. In fact, he was one of my first teachers when I was in college, and I had the pleasure of knowing him since then. He studied Islamic law and theology at many institutes, including Darul Uloom in Deoband, which is one of the leading <coughs> centers of Islamic learning in South Asia, as well as juridical law at Patna Bahar, India. And he has, he's really an expert in the, what's called the theosophy of Ibn al-Arabi and Shah Waliullah, two of the most important sort of post-classical thinkers in the Islamic tradition. Sheikh Amin. Thank you. Good evening all. It's a pleasure to be here and I know Azam has always been somewhat revolutionary. I didn't think he'd pull this off, but anyway, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a compliment, by the way, Azam. Uh, it's been great listening to everybody here on the panel and also Dr. Wolf. Uh, he's asked the question. Uh, I believe that the question, although it's pertinent, it may not be as relevant as perhaps trying to understand what each uh, religion does to its members after they worship. So mm. I would rather focus on what does worshiping the same God bring about? What's the result of worship? So in our Islamic theosophy, the word just, you just heard, uh, we believe that the, 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 the point of worship is to become close to God. Whether you understand that God to be the same as the God of the Christian or the Jew or anyone else, the purpose is to become close to God. And the way that we see this in Islam is that the worshiper, the worshiper relinquishes everything of his own and annihilates himself in front of the worshipped, the abid and the ma'bud, as we say in Arabic. So, if this is the true reality of worship, that we want to be close to God in such a way that the experience is spiritual, then that spirituality will eventually come down to what my good friend, Dr. Swanson, said about Ihsan that you bring this state of worship into every aspect of life where you are close to God and because you're close to God your ihsan, your excellence in behavior with other people is now very manifest and very apparent and it is for this that uh, Muslims believe through the Quran that uh, if we truly love God the Quran says then follow Muhammad because if you follow Muhammad God will love you but following Muhammad needs to be very well defined. What does it mean to follow Muhammad? So the Prophet Muhammad said, pray the way you see me praying. So in prayer you have the mechanics, 
you have everything that is in the physical realm, and you make ablution, and you do this and that, etc. You go through the motions. But there's, al there's also another aspect to prayer in Islam. That is the aspect of Ihsan, where we want to pray the way Muhammad prayed. And the way Muhammad prayed was that he was absolutely absorbed in the remembrance of God that he would not notice anyone around him. And that absorption is your spiritual experience. I would like to see a discussion on this and see what does worship entail in each religion. Whether it's Judaism, Christianity, whether it's a, any form of mysticism or Islam, what is the product? The product must be something that is spiritual. The fact that as we become more spiritual, the, the, the political uh, overtones and the social uh, implications of your worship, they are going to be obvious as long as you follow the spiritual code of worship within your religion. And that to me is the core of human existence and coexistence today. Hmm. If you are close to God, you will not hurt a single human being. It is not possible. The fact that you hit <laughs> the fact that you hurt other human beings is a sign that you're not close to God. And this is what Muslim scholars and theologians and Sufis have been saying for centuries, that in order for us to become close to people and to be good to people, we must become close to God, especially when we're in the act of worship. Mm. So my suggestion would be, hopefully, I hope nobody takes offense with this, especially Azam, that we have a discussion on the spirituality of worshiping this God. And thank you very much. Thank you, Sheikh. I mean, uh, before uh, Professor uh, Wolf gives his response to these uh, comments, I just want to remind everybody that there were uh, written uh, handouts that were given, a card, note cards for written questions. We're going to try to answer some of them if we can. Um, and also, um, the book that was referenced by Professor Wolf, uh, the one he talked about, is called, right here, Allah, A Christian Response. There are some copies still remaining. If you'd like to purchase some at the end of the program, you can still do that. So with that, uh, Professor Wolf. Thank you. Thank, I appreciate very much uh, responses and uh, contributions of this, uh, of this panel. And with much what I have heard, uh, I entirely and completely uh, agree. Um, I think there is a long Christian tradition of uh, affirming that Muslims and Christians uh, believe in the same God. There is also uh, some resistance to it on the Christian, on the Christian uh, part. So there is a kind of internal uh, debate within Christianity itself. As And I think uh, if I listen to correctly what uh, Sheikh Amin has said, as there is in Islam and maybe even at this, uh, at this table within in Islam debate uh, whether Muslims and Christians uh, worship the same God. I think that's a very important discussion uh, for us to have. I think it's important because, um, uh, let me put it this way, it is no accident to, uh, in my mind that this discussion became really significant after 9-11. And the reason it became significant is because the more the enmity between the two uh, increases, the more the pressure become, comes there for the other to be different than us. Mm -hmm. Any commonality between us then suddenly calls into question the enmity that we, we feel. Uh, you know, I, I illustrate this with the, with the example of, of French fries. Suddenly, when the French wouldn't be uh, with <laughs> us <laughs> as, we were, uh, as we were creating a coalition, Americans stopped eating French fries. French fries became freedom fries, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because uh, the favorite food had attached to itself the name of our, at that time, uh, quote-unquote, uh, enemy. And in this sense, I think it's a very important uh, kind of cultural thing 
to to keep in mind the, the, this uh, this question. Obviously, the discussions of the substance uh, need to remain and need to be carried uh, very uh, very vigorously. Um, um, I, th though, as some of you know, I have been on the uh, on on one side of the debate in recent Wheaton uh, <laughs> discussions on this issue, and and, and took uh, um, uh, one side uh, very decidedly. Uh, I I do appreciate and do see the other uh, the other Wheaton and have friends uh, in that other uh, other Wheaton, which I think is very significant. And I think also that it's important for us uh, to keep in mind that media distorts. And f above all, that media will not hear the good news. I resonated very much with you have, what you have said. Uh, I had the same experience when, uh, uh, and actually the, the writers of the common word had the same experience. Mm. They, used, they used the best publicity firm in the, in the universe, in the country, in the world. And it didn't help to propel the common word at the forefront of the attention of media. Mm -hmm. When we wrote a response, uh, uh, we tried very hard to get the attention of media. It was impossible. We actually had to pay $50,000 <laughs> to get an ad in New York Times to publish it. Because wow. nobody else would do it. The, the ad that was in New York Times was paid ad. Wow. Media was not interested in the fact that there are most prominent evangelical and other Christians in the country affirming together with Muslims a position that what binds them together is love of God and love of neighbor. We live in the environment where the good that we do and, uh, and the, the, the somehow remains unseen. I don't think there is necessarily maliciousness involved, but there is a disinterest because, uh, let's see, uh, let's say it frankly, the good news does not sell. Mm. You know, yeah. <laughs> if the subway uh, every day goes on time, right? That's not news. If it breaks down, it's a big news. <laughs> and so we concentrate because our reality is mediated to us through media. We see the breakdowns but we don't see the proper functioning. And in many ways, I think it's a compliment to our expectations from the world. We expect yeah. the world to be good. Yeah. And therefore, that's not news. News is when something goes, goes wrong. Um, we need to, therefore, build networks of relationships so that the entire uh, reality is not filtered through media which concentrates on the negative. And finally, the comment that I want to make is about, uh, about worship. I think what happens in our worship is as important, almost, not quite as important, as who we worship and what we worship. Because it's possible to say, we know that from Christian, uh, Christian tradition, it is possible to say, Lord, Lord, Lord. Hmm and be furthest away from God just in the process of saying the name of God. Saying the name of God so as to be able to do what isn't pleasing to God. Mm. That happens in religious circles, and perversion of religion happens when we invoke God, but in our actions we are far from God. And that's why in Christian tradition we speak about worship not simply in terms of what we do with our mouths, what we do in our, when we, our faces are turned toward God or are bowed before God, but we think of worship of God in our deeds. Mm. Indeed, our everyday life is an act of worship. Uh, in the Christian circles, the same word is used for work as it is used for worship. Our work, everyday work, can be and ought to be an act of worship and this discussion of what is involved in worshiping God, mm -hmm. how do we worship God in a way that our characters get to be aligned with God, this is one of the fundamental questions that we are facing because worship is not just what we say but how we align our lives with the character of God. Mm. Thank you, Professor Wolf. <clears throat> Well, we, uh, we heard a lot tonight. We heard a lot about history. We heard about thinkers. We heard about concepts. We heard about scripture. We heard about worship um, and spirituality. And it's a lot to work with. 
And, but we do appreciate the level of the discourse for community-wide events such as this. And I think that the, both the presentations and the comments by our panelists were just excellent. So let's get everyone a big round of applause. We do have written questions from the audience uh, that we will pass up to me. But before we get to that, I'd like to at this point invite uh, Dr. Uh, Yusuf Chaudhry, uh, who is the head of the Religious Committee, up to the podium, as well as Chairman uh, Aftab Khan to the podium as well. And as you can see, they're very eager to come up to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you all are aware of uh, the issue that was raised a couple months ago that really gave rise to the issue that has been discussed, at least in some elemental way in the media, uh, but that has been part of an ongoing conversation begun by the common word and the Yale response culminating in a book by Professor Wolf, and then his op-ed piece that he wrote in December really uh, to support uh, the actions of Sister Professor Dr. Larisha Hawkins, who in the midst of really a trying time for the American Muslim community, a trying time for us as a nation, in one of the most, I would say, difficult periods in American history, uh, very contentious politically, uh, that she took a very bold statement to support a minority population that's 1% in this country uh, that is facing the kind of bigotry that we have not seen in many, many decades, and not only stood with them, but was willing to sacrifice her professional career and her financial situation. A lot of us face difficulties all the time in life. It's not that hard to say no to hate. Believe it or not, for most people, we can really, when we see hate, when we see bigotry, most of us can say that that's wrong. It's not wrong to see uh, unethical actions and to condemn them. And sometimes it's not that hard to even say it publicly. And those of us who are fortunate enough to do so, we can publicly say no to this, no to that. But it's a whole different level to say, I will stand with this beleaguered community in the face of whatever comes my way. That is a whole different ballgame, ladies and gentlemen. So with that, <laughs> with that, the Islamic Foundation is um, really honored uh, and excited that Professor Larisha Hawkins has joined us tonight. And in that token of friendship, solidarity, peace, and justice, we'd like to present her with an award. So ladies and gentlemen, if you can please give attention to and stand up for a hero of our times, mm -hmm. Professor Larisha Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Uh, the award that will present to her, you can sit down. <laughs> the award that will be presented to her says, in the, uh, uh, in the name of God, the most compassionate, merciful, and it uh, has a Quranic verse, O human beings, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes so that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. Indeed, God is all knowing and all aware. The Islamic Foundation of Villa Park presents the special humanitarian award to Dr. Larisha Hawkins for her devotion to faith, peace, and justice as exemplified by her solidarity with the Muslim community. It's such an honor to be here 
<clears throat> and I was at the talk in 2011. I'm going to blame Dr. Wolf for all of this. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, esteemed colleagues, thank you for your words. Um, and I um, have been privileged to get to know a large percent of the 1% of Muslims um, in the United States via Chicago um, and via um, Facebook. <laughs> And it's been um, overwhelming in the most positive way. Um, the Imam spoke about theosophy, and it reminded me of uh, theodicy. And theodicy is uh, the development of meaning from suffering, which the African American community and the Muslim community are very close to. And theodicy is um, worship through suffering. And suffering with is what I hope to do by wearing the hijab. And suffering with does not require courage. It just requires faith. And it requires faith, which means emptying ourselves out on behalf of the other. Emptying ourselves out with, um, without anything in our hands, but with poverty. Because that's the state that we come to worship, the God of the universe that we all adore. And so worship, though, um, as we know, is dangerous. Worship is work. And worship can cost us our lives when we stand with the oppressed. It could cost us our job. It could cost us friends. It might cost us membership in a country where a president wants to kick some of us out. But um, worship, actually, worship is what will change our country. Uh, the true worshipers, when we come together and worship in spirit and truth, the one God of the universe who holds all things together. So I pray that we will come to the end of ourselves to be living sacrifices for our neighbors, our Muslim brothers and sisters, and all who are oppressed. Thank you again for this honor. Mm. Thank you, Professor uh, Hawkins, for coming and sharing your words of wisdom and reflection. Um, we have about 10 minutes before we start the Muslim evening prayer. You might hear the call of prayer upstairs. But many of you ask questions, so I'm going to ask as rapid fire questions as we can go. So you're going to have to answer a little you know, shorter than a global theologian otherwise would. <laughs> OK, can someone from the Muslim Christian scholars comment on the mercy of God in the Quran and does it compare to the Christian concept of unconditional love? Anybody? Uh, uh, you want to take that? Or uh, otherwise, Sheikh Amin can. can, can I, I, I think this is a question for a Muslim to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Quran always speaks about God's compassion, His mercy. Uh, it starts off, as you all know, with the Bismillah rahman rahim formula which is in the name of God, who is the compassionate, the merciful. And we can go on and on for another few hours just to discuss how many verses and how many uh, chapters of the Quran speak about God's eternal mercy. The issue with mercy in the Quran is not necessarily related to God's eternal mercy. It's more related to human action, that how, how do human beings acquire now God's mercy? So the onus in Islam is on the human being to perform in such a way that he attracts God's eternal mercy. The Quran speaks about God being merciful simply because he created everything. So that by virtue of God creating everything and everyone, there is enough mercy for us to observe in the world. And that is why throughout our history, we've always preached and promoted the idea and the value of coexistence. And uh, through that coexistence, God wants to give us all a chance to earn more of his mercy. So it's merit-based uh, uh, attraction and merit-based acquisition uh, of God's eternal mercy. This is what we know about 
the Quran speaking about God's mercy in this world. In the other world, then God's mercy is going to be much greater as the Prophet Muhammad himself said that if there were 100 parts of God's mercy, he created this world with 1% of that mercy and through that 1% of that mercy, everybody in the world, in the universe, whoever came, whoever will come, uh, whoever is here, will show mercy and compassion towards each other. The other 99% is reserved for the Day of Judgment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, a, uh, just a maybe quick uh, response then to the, to the question as it was posed. Uh, I think that uh, in, in, in Christian and Muslim understandings, if we take what, was, uh, what Sheikh Amin has just said, that there is a difference in emphasis. Uh, so that unconditionality of love means that uh, mercy is not merited, that mercy is not, within, is not acquired, right? And I think the important discussions uh, that need to take place are just on this issue. This is a very significant issue, both on the Islam side of things and also on Christian side of things. And discussions have been going on on this issue. And it's a very important one. OK, thank you. Next is, I think this is for Professor Wolf. God is not an object. <laughs> I'm no. put it in quotes, by the way. <laughs> In light of this, is it theologically correct to say that we worship the same object? God is a person, a subject. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, depending on how you use the word object. Obviously, I put the object in quotation mark. God is not an object. Actually, you have to put person in quotation marks as well. <laughs> right? <laughs> if you want to properly uh, speak about it. And so uh, this is the limitation of our language. And I think given that limitation, it's still the question or the object that which we worship, the one whom we worship, uh, the identity, it remains. Mm. Uh, Professor Milner, this is for you. Um, don't you think that evangelicals are misunderstood in the media and in general, in our general culture, because of its heavy involvement in American politics? Well, that has been changing, hasn't it? Um, and we have looked upon decades where we were cozy in a way that maybe wasn't good for our souls. And maybe that has been changing. Um, maybe people are very frustrated with that change, but our citizenship is in heaven first. And if someone is confused enough, that the epistle to the Hebrews teaches this beautifully. And if someone is confused enough to equate, or even worse, put their American citizenship before that citizenship in heaven, then I hope they don't get power, because that's hmm. going to put us in a tr troubling situation. OK. Um. Most of us already agreed on the similarity between Christians and Muslims. Well, that's good to know. How can we move past this intellectual exercise and work together in our individual struggles in faith? Who wants to an answer that pastoral question? Emulate Professor Hawkins. Yeah. <laughs> Do as she did. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> That's an excellent answer. Uh, the work that we do at understanding one another is important. Um, the, the first question that we had about love and mercy, I mean, it's easy to give a yes answer or a no answer, but what we want is the kind of conversation where we really draw this out, you know, where we talk, what do we mean by love? What do we mean by mercy? And as we go deep, that's where we find uh, uh, commonalities. That's also where we find differences, but that's where the interesting stuff happens is when we really go deep rather than being satisfied with the, oh yes, oh no. Um, but it's not just a matter of talking, um, as some of my colleagues keep reminding me. Uh, it's not just a matter of talking, this is a matter of doing. What can we do together to build up our communities together? Uh, what can we do together to stand up for one another? At a similar event, the Islamic scholar Tariq Ramadan looked at a group like this and said, if you're here, you're not the ones that need to be here. Go out and tell the people <laughs> who don't come here what yeah, happened. Yeah, so I think yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
As much of the difference is about Trinity, when did Trinity become part of Christianity? Why is Trinity important to Christianity? I think it's very simple. Is, uh, Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God. And because Jesus Christ, uh, God, uh, Jesus Christ is the self-revelation of God, Christians believe in the Holy Trinity. It's not that God became the Holy Trinity when Jesus became incarnate. It is that it was manifest in the fact of the divinity of Jesus Christ that throughout all eternity, God was the Holy Trinity. So Trinity is, uh, is a kind of fundamental conviction just as much as or even more than uh, the belief in the divinity of Jesus Christ. I, I, there's a couple more uh, questions kind of addressing something that was alluded to earlier, which is, you know, how do we, what do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Uh, and I will take the discretionary step of answering that question, which is, you know, there's a lot of activism. I mean, there's not enough activism, obviously, from our respective communities. We can always do more to um, make the world a better place, uh, individually, in terms of family, collectively, and socially. And, and if we're brave enough, and if we have enough heart, then we can also take the steps that Professor Hawkins has, t has taken in different parts of our lives. But I think what should be emphasized is that the discussion that we had tonight is not over. It needs to be replicated, in particularly because these issues are not exclusive for one community or the other, or the ivory towers of academia. But in the world that we're living in, with the words religion, terrorism, fear, deportation, immigration, being shown on a daily basis. This is not the time to freak out. This is not the time to be scared and afraid or fearful, but rather sit back and understand even further from our own traditions. I've been doing interfaith for 20 years, and one of the reasons, I know like with Mark and Rita and others, is that I have been able to become a better Muslim hmm. when I communicate with, when I correspond with, when I engage with my Christian counterparts and Jewish counterparts. And I'm sure they feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Mark lived in Cairo. He taught in Cairo for many years. His wife uh, lives in Indonesia as we speak. Hmm. So when we engage with the other, we should not fear that somehow it's going to affect or diminish our faith, but rather it works in many ways the other way if you are true to who you really want to be in the deep core of your faith and tradition. So this, tonight's event is really intended to further the dialogue, further the discussions, and further our understanding of this complex world that we live in. I'd like to thank the Islamic Foundation and the Council of Islamic Organizations for this event tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank the Interfaith Committee of the Islamic Foundation, uh, and some of them you've seen here. We have uh, Amir here, we've got Ali, Amir, Zahir, Ali, Ahmed, Tanvir Malik, uh, Safdar, and others are here. Uh, and um, others were unable to come, a couple of people are actually out of, uh, out of the country. Um, and thank you to our guest speaker, our panel, of course, Professor Hawkins, and to you for coming tonight. And I, we just have a few closing remarks by Amir Zahir. I was just going to hand stuff out. I don't know about remarks. Uh, I, I do, uh, in the subject of dialogue, we've all learned a lot tonight and, and spoken quite a bit about the importance of dialogue. And as Azam mentioned, one of the most critical things is to have that ongoing dialogue and not just tonight. So if you were moved tonight, if you were if you felt a little more enlightened tonight, if you feel a little more brotherhood tonight, one of the things we'd encourage you to do is to stay in touch with us as an organization, certainly uh, reach out to the panel afterwards. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't able to get all your questions. What we will try and do with uh, our database that we have and our email list that we have is to see if we can address some of the questions. Thank you so much for, for sending those in. We weren't able to get to all of them. What I am gonna pass around is uh, sheets of paper that will ask you for your feedback on the event tonight. And more importantly, we'll ask you, if you're willing, to share some of your contact information with us so that we can continue to stay in touch. 
whether it be via email, whether it be via social media, or what have you. But that ongoing dialogue is critical. We hope to have continued events like this in the future. And if you enjoyed tonight, if you learned from tonight, uh, please do try and stay in touch with us. We, we will continue to have great events like this in the future. But thanks again to the panel. And thanks again for coming. So in terms of what's next, um, it's the Muslim evening prayer time, so many of us are going to go upstairs and finish praying, but we will come back down. You're welcome to stay, uh, engage in further discussions. I think there's a few uh, snacks still remaining. Uh, Professor Wolf still has some books left if you'd like to uh, purchase and get his signature. Uh, and the panel and everybody else can remain and continue to dialogue. Thank you, and may God go with you. Oh, and Professor Wolf is accepting cash and checks for the books. Not just cash, but checks too. <laughs>